Shabbat Shalom, everyone. In just a moment, uh, a few minutes, a rabbinic moment is really a few minutes. Um, but in a few minutes after the sermon, we're going to turn it over to the Torah service and Bobby will read Torah and share his words um, on Parshat Bereshit. And before that, I want to offer you some thoughts that I have on this Shabbat morning. So welcome. My sister Dev gave a TEDx talk this week. So think about the context in the midst of all of this upheaval that we're all going through. She got that coveted call where she was challenged to share the wisdom of her 30 years of activism in the perfectly concise 12 minute format. So she did it. She gave a brilliant and a beautiful talk about how to steer activists from burnout and exhaustion as we try to tackle the injustice of the world by sharing the wisdom that she's learned from the earth over the course of the last decade as an urban homesteader. And the talk will be released soon and you can hear it. And in the course of it, she, she maps the course of a healthy, sustainable activism that's based on this regenerative earth wisdom that she's now dedicated her life to. And as her sister, I, I, I really dug into this talk with her and got to hear it. And really, I have to admit, spent a lot more time over the course of the last couple of weeks thinking about the processes of planting and growing than I ever have before. I'm well known in my house for basically killing everything I try to plant, not on purpose, of course, but that's just... Uh, that's just the way it goes. I'm good at other things, I say. I'm good at the dishes, um, but I'm not great at, at understanding how the earth works. But I've been deep in this process with her. And I think for that reason, I was really struck as I read Parsha Bereshit this week by one bizarre detail of our creation story. So I want to bring you to um, Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Ele toldot hashamayim va'aretz bar am. These are the, this is the story of the heaven and earth when they were created. And, and the text goes on to say, and again, this is in the second chapter of Genesis, when God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field was on the earth and no grass of the field had sprouted. Okay, so in the second chapter of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth, but nothing had yet emerged from out of the earth. Nothing was growing. So the earth remains bare and empty and devoid of vegetation. And that should seem strange to you because you might remember from chapter one of the book of Genesis that on the third day, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation and there'll be all kinds of plants and trees and everything else that's in it will bear fruit and bear everything that the seeds will be planted and they will all bear fruit. So, so we know that on the third day of creation, the earth brought forth vegetation from chapter one. But then in chapter two, we learned that none of that vegetation went past the surface of the earth. So there was all kinds of vegetation, but it was all underneath the surface. And it's a really weird textual uh, inconsistency. And one that I, again, I admit, I had never really spent much time on, maybe because there's so much other good stuff to think about in Parshat Bereshi. Well, the rabbis in the Gemara raise this question because they don't miss anything. And in Chulin, they say the following. They say, how can it be that in chapter one of Genesis, the whole earth is covered in vegetation starting on the third day? But in chapter two, we learn that nothing has yet emerged. They say the reason why is because it was all there and it was ready to burst through the surface of the earth, but it was waiting for Adam. It was waiting for the creation of human beings, which again, were not created until the sixth day. So on the third day, all the greenery was created, but it stayed under the surface of the earth until Adam, the first person came and prayed for mercy for them. And then the rain came and they sprouted. Okay, so everything's created on the third day, the plants, the trees, they're all ready to bear fruit, but they're placed beneath the earth's surface. And, and just before breaking ground, they stop and they wait for us, for Adam, for human beings. And when the human being comes, they put their hands into the soil and that's when the vegetation breaks through. It makes me think about that story that you may have heard about the Chinese bamboo. So here's the thing about the Chinese bamboo. So once it's planted, it has to be fed water and sunlight 
and fertile soil. And you do that for an entire year, but there's no visible indicator of growth by the end of that year. And so you do it again for a second year. And again, nothing emerges. And then the third year, and then the fourth year, and there's no growth that's visible from the earth. And you start to think, am I wasting my time? Is anything ever going to blossom here? And then just when you think that you're ready to start giving up hope and maybe start planting something else, like milkweed, help bring back the butterflies, all of a sudden in the fifth year, the bamboo bursts through the earth's surface. I read once that the Chinese bamboo tree grows 90 feet in six weeks, as much as three feet in one day. It's like Bobby at the end of the summer when he came back to Shoal a couple of years ago. And I'm like, oh my God, Bobby, Bobby grew like three feet over the summer. And, and the same thing I have to say happened to Levi this summer too. I, I don't know what that, it, what that is, but it's very unusual. They grow as, as much as three feet in one day. It's astonishing. And also, by the way, the Chinese bamboo, it's, it's one of the most renewable plants because it begins regenerating immediately after it's harvested. So, so rabbis love this story and entrepreneurs love this story and life coaches love this story because what it teaches us is for many, many years you're working and there's no visible impact to your work. And maybe you start to despair, but what you don't see that's happening all that time is that there's a sophisticated root system that's developing under the surface, that's gaining the strength to support the eventual growth of what's ultimately going to emerge. And there's an obvious and a really important lesson to that for us today. Bereshit, the book of Genesis tells us that everything we need for the flourishing of our world already existed beneath the surface and was busy building strength under the surface even when we could not see those dreams come to fruition. And what did it take for them to actually break through the surface of the earth? It took our work and it took our faith that it would ultimately emerge. Last year marked the 25th anniversary of the first free all race election in a post apartheid South Africa. And I remember it, it was 1994, I was in my junior year of college I remember the fear of violence. It was almost unimaginable that there could be a peaceful transition of power after nearly 50 years of apartheid, after hundreds of years of racial terror and oppression in that country. And what I remember happening is that instead of images of war, we saw images of lines, long, long lines of people waiting for their chance to vote in the first election of their lifetime. And one of my favorite pictures was an image that came out of Soweto of thousands of people zigging and zagging through an empty lot waiting to cast their ballot. And there were lots of other photos like this too. There were lines of people on the side of the highway, people lining up in small townships, people lining up along dirt paths. Many of these people were 70, 80, 90 years old, they were singing and dancing and cheering while they waited some of them all day to cast their vote. And one person famously said that day for the first time in my life, I feel like a human being today. Of course, I'm thinking about those images today, this week, after seeing the early voting that started in many states here in the US and images that we've all seen of thousands of people waiting in interminable lines in Georgia and Texas and Ohio, lining up in the dark of night at 4 a.m. and many people spending the entire day waiting online, taking images of themselves, selfies, pumping their fists after they've successfully voted, sharing their exhaustion, their exuberance, their outrage as they successfully cast their ballot. And yes, it is an outrage. Nobody should have to wait for even an hour, let alone a full day to vote in this country. And yes, it's a poll tax because only those people who can afford to take a day off of work have the luxury of that kind of wait. And yes, it's targeted discrimination. We remember the court ruling in 2017 that ruled that North Carolina voter ID laws were designed to block black Americans from voting with surgical precision. And even still, it is a victory to see those long lines. 
It's a victory to see that many people eager to turn their ballots in. And it's heartening to see a kind of enthusiasm that we've maybe never seen before in this country, to see so many millions of people stand up and affirm that our voices matter in crafting our shared future. And it's impossible not to notice the parallels. Of course, they're totally different circumstances. South Africa in 1994 and the United States in 2020. And it's impossible not to note the similarities between these images from 26 years ago in South Africa and us today in the United States. And I find myself as I contemplate these similarities, not only focused on the outcome of South Africa's first election, free election, when Nelson Mandela became president by a huge margin, but also I'm thinking about the 27 years that he spent before that day in a maximum security prison on Robben Island. The conditions were brutal. He was forced daily into hard labor. I read that black prisoners on Robben Island were not allowed to wear socks or underwear or even long pants, even on the coldest days of the year. I'm thinking about all of those years of suffering and isolation, of struggle and setback, all those years in which the yield of his fruit, of his the yield of his labor, the, the fruit of his labor, stubbornly remained below the earth's surface. And if you look then in the years leading up to 1994, you would see something similar to what you would see if you looked at the bamboo tree in years one, two, three, or four you would not have known how this story would end. You might have thought that nothing will ever change. You might have despaired. But then on April 27th of 1994, the world witnessed the flowering of that tree that pushed through the earth's surface, planted generations before. That was the day that freedom was born in that country. And I can't look at those lines of people waiting five, eight, 11, 12 hours to vote in this country with folding chairs and snacks and umbrellas and not believe that the same thing might be true in America right now. That something is bursting through the surface in this moment. That so many years of struggle and heartache and setbacks and regress might be poised to burst through the earth's surface in the blossoming of a new reality for our country. God created the world and bequeathed us an earth that was covered in beautiful, dense vegetation, everything we would ever need. It was already there on day three, but you couldn't see any of it because it was waiting beneath the surface of the earth, waiting for Adam and Eve, for their dedication, for their love, for their faith. And when the time was right, the Holy One permitted them to see the fruit of their labor. I pray that we too find the strength, especially in these days ahead, to plant our love and strength and faith into the threatened and yet still fertile soil of our democracy. And may we too be blessed to watch in the days ahead as the seeds that have been planted even generations ago now flower into a beautiful, rich, healthy, just, and loving multiracial democracy. Can you hear that song?